Um, thank you to everyone for joining this really important uh, webinar to address a really important issue and crisis in New York City happening now. Um, my name is Arielle Pallets. I am the executive director of the Office of Nightlife. Um, for those of you who may not know, the office was created just a little over three years ago to serve as a dedicated non-enforcement liaison between the city and the nightlife industry and community to really ensure that information and resources and support are being exchanged between the city and our beloved nightlife community. Um, as I welcome you all here today, I just want to acknowledge the very sharp rise in COVID cases that we are all witnessing and experiencing um, that is happening this week in New York City with the emergence of the Omicron variant. Um, and I know that there's a lot of concern and anxiety among friends and staff and coworkers testing positive and with events canceling. So I would just say right now, we really encourage that everyone just continue to get vaxxed, get boosted, mask up, even if you're vaxxed, when indoors, when you can, so that we can just continue to get through this We've gotten this far by working together and we will continue to do so. The purpose of the webinar today, however, is to bring resources, awareness and training um, to you as part of the city's efforts to combat the growing opioid overdose pandemic in New York City. As you likely know, there is a fentanyl crisis. Uh, with the unintended use of fentanyl in New York City's drug supply. Um, fentanyl continues to drive overdose deaths in New York and was involved in 68% of all overdose deaths in 2019. We also know that the stigma of substance use in nightlife can be particularly challenging and that substance use takes place in all parts of life, in different settings and workplaces, both day and night, and is not exclusive to nightlife. But because of this stigma, many venues and workers may be hesitant to use naloxone or fentanyl test strips. But you should know that both naloxone Narcan and test strips are not considered drug paraphernalia and are legal life-saving measures and tools in New York. The New York City Police Department is also aware of this fact. We have been hearing concerns from owners and workers about the use of them in their venues and fear of enforcement. Um, both the police department um, and the city are promoting the use of Narcan and in venues. And we, the Office of Nightlife, regularly attends New York City Police Department meetings with venues to ensure that everyone is on the same page and are, do and are not hesitant to use these life-saving measures out of fear of enforcement. We want nightlife spaces not only to be seen where space, where places where people can socialize, but where we also look out for each other. And so the Office of Nightlife is proud to be taking part in the city's new harm reduction approach to address these issues by recognizing the real world human behavior rather than simply criminalizing or suppressing it and bringing these life-saving harm reduction tools to New York City's nightlife community. And that's why we're here today partnering with the Department of Health to launch our Narcan Behind Every Bar Awareness Campaign to encourage venues and staff and security to obtain free overdose rescue kits by mail and how to learn how to use them. Every venue and promoter is encouraged to have at least a few doses of Narcan on hand in case of a suspected overdose. The way we look at it, it's much like having a CPR kit or a first aid kit behind the bar or the free NYC co uh, condoms. These are just harm reduction tools that can help venues be prepared to promote public health and save lives. 
Today, each of you will become a certified opioid overdose responder. And later in the presentation, uh, we, you will learn how you can receive your overdose rescue kit with naloxone in it. While the focus of today's presentation is Narcan training, I also want to make you aware that we have been working with the Department of Health to promote the use and availability of fentanyl test strips, which is also a public health tool that will allow people to use um, who use drugs to test the presence of fentanyl in substances. Venues and promoters can and should distribute fentanyl strips if they are comfortable doing so. We uh, recently hosted an extensive one hour webinar with an introduction to fentanyl test strips and availability with the Department of Health. So there is a dedicated webinar already to the use and awareness of fentanyl test strips. And we will put a link to that webinar in the chat so you can also watch it after. For today's webinar though, we will have a presentation from my colleague at the Department of Health, Shaquasia Shannon, who is an overdose prevention training coordinator at the Bureau of Alcohol and Drug Use Prevention, Care and Treatment at the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. She is also um, has her colleagues here, um, Margo and, Ali and Elisa, who will be also in the chat room, who will be answering your questions. Um, after the presentation and throughout, there will also be time for Q&A. So the way we are managing this today is if you could use the Q&A feature to let us know your questions or concerns, you will be answered throughout and also live. So anyway, um, Thank you again for coming. Uh, this is really important. This is a new era in New York. This is important information. And although it's not a mandate to have Narcan kits behind every bar, we really do encourage it because bars can save lives with Narcan. And without further ado, I will pass it off to my colleague, Shaquasia. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Um, hi, everyone. Um, so before getting started, I want to make sure I can share my screen and that you can see it. That would be really important um, for the training today. So I'm actually going to ask you to put into the chat. I have my colleagues, Anisla, Maggie, as well as Tuya. Um, they will be helping and assisting me today managing the chat because we want to make sure we get all the questions um, from you all that you want answers to, and we're gonna do our best job to answer those questions. So before sending in any questions, I wanna confirm, please put in the chat, if you can see my slide that is up right now, just to make sure that we're all um, on the same page. Yes, perfect, great. So I will say, this is a little trick for the fact that you've responded now, I anticipate for you to respond later and to, um, also participate in the chat as well. So you've given yourself away a little bit. Uh, so to start off, I do want to present a content advisory. So it's really important to highlight um, that when we're having these trainings, especially around naloxone and having discussions around drug use, that it can bring up a lot of emotions for folks. Um, and that is normal. And we just want you to kind of acknowledge that as you hear this information um, and acknowledging like the far reaching impacts of our overdose crisis. Um, and continually in these most recent times, our COVID-19 pandemic as well um, can shine a grim light on structural racism and racial inequities that exist within our society. So we really do encourage you to take care of yourself during today's training, after today's training. If this, uh, the information you're hearing impacts you in any way, we want you to focus on what that self-care routine looks like for you. But also additionally, if that means you need to step away for a moment and then come back, um, that is perfectly okay as well. So what I'll be covering in this training is really first starting off giving, giving everyone a sense of how New Yorkers are being impacted by our overdose crisis. So how is overdose affecting New Yorkers? And this is really focusing on the data that we have. So in the last few weeks, we've actually released, um, newly released our 2020 data. So I'll be uh, doing my best job to share that information with you as um, we've all just got um, 
got uh, our hands on it and, and released it to the public. So it'd be really important for everyone to know what's um, going on in our city. Um, then understanding what an opioid overdose is and why naloxone is such an important life-saving tool. And then we'll go through the steps of responding to an opioid overdose specifically. So the things that we need you to look out for in, in regards to signs of an overdose, the things we need you to do when you're responding and how to administer naloxone. In this specific situation, we'll be um, showing you how to administer Narcan um, and uh, the after steps in regards to um, any follow up that may be needed. So when it comes to how to access naloxone, we will be providing information today of how you can access naloxone as part of today's training, but also give a little bit more details about how you may be able to reach out to us in case you need more access to naloxone at a later date. Um, so there is some uh, COVID-19 specific guidance that is given out throughout the training today. Um, and I will highlight that um, just so that people are aware um, as we go through today's training. So before going deeper into the data, into the things that uh, we need you to do, say, look out for when responding to an opioid overdose, it's really important that we all start off on the same page. So making sure you understand what I mean when I say it. So I'm gonna start off with our first key term. So when I am mentioning opioids in today's training, I am um, including uh, talking about a specific class of pain relievers. Um, you may have heard of prescription painkillers such as Vicodin or Percocet. We tend to call those opioid analgesics. So you may see that, 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 like, that term come up later on in the training, but also acknowledging that that's just not what, that's not the only opioids that people should be aware of and that people know about. This also, opioids also include heroin as well as fentanyl. So we will definitely have a larger discussion about fentanyl in today's training, but I want to make sure that you walk away knowing at the end of the day that fentanyl is a highly potent, fast-acting opioid. So what does that mean? Fentanyl is a strong opioid and it works quickly. And then last the next key term is making sure folks know what naloxone is. So if you are thinking about getting a naloxone kit for your, for your location, it's really important that you know exactly what it is. Um, and naloxone is a safe medication that reverses the effects of opioids and prevents that overdose from being fatal. So today's training, I do want to point out when I'm saying naloxone, naloxone is that generic medication name. So no, but you also may hear me use Narcan interchangeably, specifically when we're talking about how to administer Narcan. I want you to think about Narcan as that brand name for the uh, one-step nasal spray formulation of naloxone. So just so that we're clear, so people have something to uh, relate it to. So if you ever went into a grocery store, a pharmacy, and you needed to find, say, uh, facial tissues. Um, so knowing that, like you may have gone in the store and saw different brands like Kleenex. We know that Kleenex is that brand name. So think of Narcan as that brand name. And then also thinking of naloxone as that generic name. So that generic name for facial tissues, you may see a store brand or pharmacy brand, but we know Kleenex as the brand name. Very similarly, I want you to think about that when thinking of naloxone, that generic medication name and Narcan, that brand name. They are safe medications. So when it comes to understanding how New Yorkers are being impacted by our overdose crisis, it's really important to start off like with the largest citywide view. And we know based off our 2020 data that unfortunately we have experienced increases in regards to our overdose our number, our overdose fatality number, as well as rate. So we know that in uh, 2020, we lost unfortunately 2,000, um, and 62 people due to a fatal overdose. So to give a better understanding of what that, what that kind of translates into um, in regards to 2,000, 2,062 people, we know that in 2020, that means that someone died of a drug overdose in New York City every five hours. So we see that, as I just presented, the numbers that we saw around across New York City, what you should be able to see right now on this slide is a map of the five boroughs. And what this map is specifically looking at is the rate of fatal overdoses by neighborhood of residents. And this is the data that we have for 2020. 
So the way this map works is that the darker the shade of blue you see in the neighborhood of residents, the higher the rate of fatal overdose overdoses were in that neighborhood of residents in 2020. So I am going to give a warning to Anisla and my other colleagues who are managing the chat. I'm going to ask folks to put into the chat, what boroughs or neighborhood of residences are you seeing um, different shades of blue? So where are you seeing blue on this map? So folks are saying Staten Island. See, I told you I got you all. I, I know your chat works, so I'm, I'm looking for your participation. So East Harlem, the Bronx, Brooklyn, Uptown, everywhere. So someone hit the nail right on the head. There, every part of New York City, unfortunately, is a shade of blue because this is truly a citywide epidemic we're dealing with in regards to our fatal overdose crisis. But a lot of you did point out these these areas that we're seeing dark shades of blue. So acknowledging that is um, seeing areas, um, if you may notice as well, um, outlined in gold or yellow, those are our top five neighborhoods in regards to the highest rates of fatal overdoses. So when it's, uh, so I did quickly see come into the chat, I did catch this question. I can actually answer this right now. This is based on where that person lived. This is not based on where the overdose occurred. So we really do try to get, get the information. This is back to the neighborhood of residents. You may notice that there's a small chunk of Manhattan that is not a shade of blue. And that actually is central, the area of Central Park. So it's really important to, also understand and to highlight, um, especially when we're looking at this map, because it's very much uh, easier for people to visualize New York City. If you're familiar with New York City neighborhoods, um, familiar um, with our boroughs, acknowledging that we see that this map is showing us that not every neighborhood of New York City is feeling the same burden in regards to our overdose crisis. It's not being felt equally through our city because we're seeing these different shades of blue. So acknowledging that again, the, where you see outlined in gold or yellow are the top five neighborhoods in regards to the highest rates of fatal overdoses. And acknowledging that in 2020, the rate of overdose deaths among South Bronx residents was more than twice the overall New York City rate. Should so, yes. I'm going to just interject real quick and just ask if people could uh, shift their entering their questions into the Q&A rather than the chat, simply because that's where the, um, the majority of people that are helping to answer and aggregate okay. questions. So yes. if you all could just shift into the Q&A for the questions, that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's not a problem. Um, and also acknowledging that we, uh, in 2020, we did see some changes and trends in regards to race and ethnicity, um, as well as poverty levels. So we know that um, the rate of overdose deaths increased among Black, Latino, and white New Yorkers from 2019 to 2020. Um, additionally, um, is, um, we know that among white New Yorkers, the rate of overdose deaths increased for the first time after three consecutive years of decreases. The rate of overdose, overdose deaths among Asian and Pacific Islander New Yorkers remained the same from 2019 to 2020. And, and when you're thinking about socioeconomic status or neighborhood poverty level, thinking around uh, that, we know that the rate of overdose deaths increased among residents of all neighborhood poverty levels, but in 2020, the rate of overdose deaths continued to be the highest in the highest in the very high poverty neighborhoods. So residents of high poverty neighborhoods accounted for nearly one third of overdose deaths among New York City residents in 2020. So it's maybe really really hard to kind of conceptualize like what might be leading to these gra geographical differences or patterns that we're seeing on this map. And as in prior years, we know the geographical patterns um, reflect inequality in income and in wealth, employment, education, criminal legal system involvement, and housing. All of these factors have been um, linked to an, in to an increased risk of overdose deaths 
and they are the result of structural racism and disinvestment in communities. So really acknowledging that no matter where you live, no matter where your business may be, acknowledging how New Yorkers are being impacted by this crisis is extremely important because um, it's just really important to know how our community is doing. So to get a better sense of between uh, rate and number, how New York City is doing in regards to our fatal overdose crisis, rate gives us a sense of the risk um, of someone live, um, of experiencing a fatal overdose. And that is what we just saw in the last slide in regards to the map. What we're looking at right now on the left side of the screen, you should see one graph that's looking at the rate of overdose deaths by borough residents matching uh, for 2020. And that matches the data we just saw on that map. It was just, it's just being presented differently um, on this slide. But what you'll see on the right side, uh, actually in a pink graph, um, is the number of drug overdose deaths by neighborhood or residents for 2020. So it's really important to highlight that we know the highest, uh, sorry, move forward uh, too early. So we know that the highest rate and highest number of drug fatal overdoses uh, was among Bronx uh, residents in 2020. So you see um, in both graphs that they actually have the highest bar. Um, and it comes to the Bronx. So right now I'm have my cursor over in the Bronx in regards to rate of fatal overdoses. Um, and then on the right side, I have my right now my cursor over the Bronx in regards to number of fatal overdoses. Um, and it's really important to show the difference between these two because as I had asked you before to put into the chat we were on that last slide, where were you seeing shades of blue? And a lot of people's eyes focused on that dark shaded blue areas of New York City. And that is perfectly okay. However, if we only looked at rate, we wouldn't necessarily be acknowledging what is the experiences of folks in other parts of New York City and acknowledging that um, fatal overdoses are truly impacting us across the city. So, Number is just a count or a tally, and that's the graph that is on the right side of the screen, while rate takes in consideration that number um, to that population size of that borough, specifically in the situation on the graph on the left side of the screen that is in blue. So as someone mentioned before, they saw dark shades of blue in Staten Island, which is true. Staten Island did, does have a, did have a high rate of fatal overdoses um, in the year 2020, as it did in previous years. And in 2020, it came in second. But if you're looking at number, you may notice that Staten Island doesn't came in fifth in regards to the five boroughs of the number of people lost in the five boroughs. That is not saying that what is happening in Staten Island is not important because they lost the least amount of people. What we're saying is that because that Staten Island uh, population size is smaller, even losing that smaller, the smallest amount of the five boroughs, because their population is smaller, it increased their risk of someone experiencing an over their rate of someone of fatal overdoses. So it's really important to highlight that even though Brooklyn came in a fourth in regards to rate, and no one really mentioned Brooklyn, no one really mentioned Queens, we see that when we're looking at number, right now the graph on the right in pink, Brooklyn came in second and then Queens came in third. So this is truly just to show us again how uh, uh, widespread um, uh, the impacts of our fatal overdose crisis are in our neighborhoods in New York City. So to get a sense of what substances were involved in fatal, uh, in fatal overdoses in 2020, um, we know that 85% of fatal, uh, fatal overdoses in New York City in 2020 included an opioid of some sort. So acknowledging that nearly all overdose uh, deaths in 2020 involved an opioid. And more specifically, 80% of fatal overdoses in New York City involved heroin or fentanyl. So as you see, as I go further down this slide, you see that cocaine or crack came in at 48% of fatal overdoses, benzodiazepine. So some folks may know these um, as benzos or Xanax, Anavan, those are uh, uh, drugs that are in that benzodiazepine category. Those were involved in 19% of fatal overdoses. Methadone was involved in 14% of fatal overdoses and opioid analgesics. So I want you to think about, again, prescription painkillers as we went over those key terms earlier, were involved in 16% of fatal overdoses. So it's important to highlight that you may notice that these percentages may seem a little off to you. 
acknowledging that they don't tally up to 100%. Because unfortunately we know, and our research shows this, if someone has experienced a fatal overdose, more than likely there's more, multiple substances involved. Uh, poly drug use or mixing of drugs and acknowledging that that is a risk factor for someone um, experiencing a overdose. So later on in the training, we'll definitely talk about some other common risk factors um, that uh, in regards to someone experiencing an overdose and what potentially are some risk reduction or harm reduction strategies people can do um, or use potentially to lower their risk of an overdose. So it's important to highlight when we're talking about mixing of drugs that approximately half, so about 48% of overdose deaths in 2020 involved more than one central nervous system depressant. That's really fancy, um, but acknowledging that central nervous system suppressants all lead to slow breathing. Um, and these are substances such as alcohol, benzodiazepines, as well as opioids. So what does that mean if someone has consumed more than one of these um, substances that lead to slow breathing in different pathways, they are at an increased risk of experiencing an overdose. So to furthermore, to highlight the presence of fentanyl in our drug supply, fentanyl is the most common substance involved in fatal overdoses um, in New York City. And Ariel did a great, uh, a beautiful job of making sure that we knew what it was um, in 2019. And we just found, just got our 2020 data um, calculated. And unfortunately, we know that in our 2020 data, fentanyl was involved in 77% of our fatal overdoses. And it's really important to highlight this because fentanyl is our driver in regards to our, uh, our overdose crisis in New York City. So when we're talking about fentanyl being in our drug supply, we're talking about a non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. So a non-pharmaceutical fentanyl is a fentanyl that's being produced in illicit laboratories. Some people may be aware of a pharmaceutical fentanyl that tends to come in patches and lollipop forms. We're not saying that people cannot misuse pharmaceutical products. Um, what we're saying is what's driving our overdose crisis in New York City is a, a non-pharmaceutical product, is a non-pharmaceutical fentanyl. In general, fentanyl is 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine, 30 to 50 times stronger than heroin. And what is really important for folks to know about fentanyl, besides that it's a strong opioid, that it works quickly, fentanyl is being found in our drug supply in opioid and non-opioid products. So we have found um, a fentanyl in uh, heroin, cocaine and crack, counterfeit pills purchased off the street or online, ketamine, methamphetamine, as well as other drugs bought off the street or online. And it's really important for people to be aware of this for the fact that those who may even occasionally use cocaine or crack um, may be at increased risk of experiencing an overdose um, because they don't necessarily have a relationship with an opioid um, and they don't necessarily have a tolerance to an, uh, to an opioid. So we do want folks to be aware of this and make sure that folks um, know that naloxone is available, they have access to naloxone, as well as know how to respond using naloxone to an overdose, as well as other uh, precautions, uh, risk reduction strategies, harm reduction strategies that can be used um, to help keep people safe while they use drugs. So one thing we do want to highlight, because we know um, that we do get this misinformation back at the Department of Health every once in a while, we want folks to know that when responding to an overdose, we don't want you to feel that you may be at risk of overdosing by responding to that overdose. We, there is no risk of overdosing by touching um, fentanyl. It's really important for folks to know that it's um, we do want folks to respond to folks uh, to people's overdoses if they see the signs of someone potentially having an overdose. We want the, um, we don't want them to hesitate because the reality is in any medical emergency, time is really important in regards to res uh, getting that person some help. So I'm going to take a quick break to uh, answer some questions. Um, they may be. Uh, may have come in and that might be really relevant to this section. So um, there are different uh, question sections built in and as well as there's one at the end. So if I don't answer it now, it doesn't mean that I won't answer it. It's just a matter of it may be best explained at a different portion in the training. Hey, so sure. and Nisa, yes. Yes, hi everyone. So we do have a few questions in the chat. Um, one is, is 
is there any outreach being done to those particular neighborhoods of higher overdoses? Um, the so I answer. So okay, so that's the other thing. Great part of having colleagues on the on the the, the training and the line with me. It's always great to have other people's support and answers as well. So there are absolutely things that are being done in neighborhoods across the city, as well as particularly the neighborhoods that we see higher rates of fatal overdoses. So acknowledging that. We are not the only ones in New York City that give out naloxone. There are many organizations um, that do. They're called opioid overdose prevention programs. They're, a lot of them are community-based organizations that try to make naloxone even more available. Um, I know in my unit, especially during the, the pandemic, um, having to think about how can we increase access to naloxone for folks. Um, there's a pilot pharmacy program where folks can um, get kits. Those are select pharmacies where they can get naloxone kits from. Um, also, so uh, thinking of all the work that others in the Bureau have done, um, acknowledging uh, what has been most recently in the news in regards to overdose prevention centers as another measure of how we can prevent fatal overdoses from occurring. So there's a lot of work that is being done. Additionally, in these neighborhoods, we have syringe service programs who have been providing services to people who use drugs for decades and continue to do that amazing work. So there's a lot of work that is is being done and there's still a lot of work that continues to be that needs to be done um acknowledging uh educating the public you all attending today's training on the office of nightlife pull, uh helping us um be, be a part of this to pull this together a part of those outreaches to make sure that we are getting the word out and the uh the fact that naloxone is very important other harm reduction strategies um and and information for folks who use drugs is extremely important as well Thanks, Shaquasia. I also have another question. Someone asked, what does age adjusted mean? And it's a technique. Um, it's a weight that's applied to disease rates and it allows us um, to compare communities with different age structures. So that's the Thanks, technical definition for it. Um, yes. We have no other questions. One other question someone asked is whether the naloxone kits um, come with the fentanyl test strips. Unfortunately, they do not but I put a link, I put several links in the chat box for places that where fentanyl test strips can be um, purchased. Those are all the questions we have so far. Thanks so much. Really appreciate that and appreciate my, uh, the team being with me, answering things in the chat, as well as um, typing them out in the Q&A if, uh, if, if they're called to do that for that answer. So I'm gonna continue on um, to give a better understanding of an, what an opioid overdose is. And this is very much a simplified uh, description of how opioids work in our body. Um, so this also helps us to better explain how naloxone works when we get to that part in the training. So what you see on your, on your screen right now is an image of someone's head inside the brain area. These are purple circles you see, and then these gray squiggly lines. The purple circles for today's purposes are representing opioids, and the gray squiggly uh, kind of lines you see are representing opioid receptors. So when someone consumes opioids, they do sit or bind to or attach attached to these opioid receptors, and they can produce things that people are looking for and things that they aren't quite looking for as well. So we know that opioids can relieve pain. So when someone consumes opioids, they can relieve pain for individuals. They also can relieve withdrawal symptoms if someone has been using opioids for some time. Um, it also can produce feelings of mental or physical wellness, uh, happiness or comfort for, for some folks, but also acknowledging that there are side effects that can come along with opioid use. So constipation, nausea, drowsiness, and respiratory depression. And again, this sounds like a little fancy word, a set of words, respiratory depression. And as a trainer, I always wanna make sure you understand exactly what I, uh, what I mean when I explain something. And respiratory depression is just slowed breathing. But the unfortunate part is, is that someone's breathing can slow down to a dangerous point. And that's where we're starting to talk about this process of an overdose, where their breathing slows down um, to a dangerous point and we see right now on the slide what that process of an opioid overdose can look like and that, that can take minutes to hours. So it starts off what I would say is a toxic amount of an opioid. That can be a strong strength of an opioid. It can be a large amount of an opioid. It can be a mix of different substances. Um, but 
what it does, it gradually suppresses that a person's involuntary drive to breathe. So their breathing then starts to slow down. As their breathing slows down, uh, potentially their breathing can, uh, can stop. Other vital organs like the brain and the heart can start to slow down and potentially stop. And as you see that I'm moving further down this process on the screen, we're getting closer and closer to someone experiencing a fatal overdose. It is rare for someone to immediately die from an overdose. So if someone survived that overdose, it is because someone was there to respond. So you're being trained on how to, be, to respond to an opioid overdose. So we do want you to know that even if you come across someone, they may be showing signs that they're at the beginning of the process of an overdose or towards the end of the process of the overdose, we still want you to follow the steps and respond to that person's overdose and administer naloxone. So it is important to highlight that we know that fentanyl is a fast acting opioid. It has the potential to shorten the timeline of this process, which unfortunately means as a responder, it shortens the time you have to respond. So this is why, again, we really encourage responders when they recognize the signs of an overdose to act urgently and follow the steps. So as I mentioned before, we're gonna talk quickly, uh, briefly about what are some common risk factors for someone experiencing an overdose. So um, these risk factors are specific to individuals who, um, who use drugs and acknowledging that that first risk factor that is on the screen that you see on the left side of the screen is that there is changes in tolerance. So when it comes to changes in tolerance is acknowledging that when uh, someone uh, has taken a break in regards to their drug use, they may not realize that that break created a situation where their tolerance to their substance lowered. And use after that break, they may not realize that they're increased risk of experiencing an overdose because of that lowered tolerance. So thinking about what are some life experiences or reasons why folks may have taken a break from their drug use, I want you to come into the chat and at I see that the, the chat has slowed down. So I hope this is okay with my colleagues. If folks can come into the chat and see, and let me know what are some reasons you believe someone may have taken a break in their drug use. So pregnancy, rehab treatment program, um, employment, it, job interview, uh, someone in their family um, experienced an overdose and they may have decided to make changes, incarceration, um, intervention. Guess what? You are all giving really great answers and, not, and none of them are wrong. Because the reality is why someone may take a break in their drug use um, is unique to that person. And it could be a, a number of different reasons, but also acknowledging that there are life experiences that different people do go go through that increased at risk of an overdose. So acknowledging that if someone who just recently got out of a rehab, a treatment program or a detox program, or they were previously incarcerated, those, those are life experiences that can create a break. But also acknowledging, thinking of our COVID-19 pandemic, um, folks may have to have quarantine or isolated uh, and they didn't have co uh, consistent access to their drug or they might have been hospitalized and it wasn't opioids weren't part of any medications that they were given acknowledging that those things may create breaks as well um, and it's really important to just for folks to be aware of how that may increase their risk of an overdose we we spoke about how mixing of drugs um, we've seen our research, we saw it as well as in New York City in our data in regards to what substances are involved in fatal overdoses. Mixing of drugs can increase someone's risk of an overdose. It, uh, so it's really important for uh, folks to be, to be aware of that risk factor. Drug quality in regards to buying drugs off of the street, off the street or online, um, is not like buying drugs from a pharmaceutical source. The reality is, is that individuals may not know what they may be getting. Um, the strength and the purity of drugs purchased off the street or online are unknown and unpredictable to changes in their quality and in their purity as well as in their strength. Um, so. Additionally, going on to the next risk factor, someone who uh, experienced a overdose before and it was non-fatal, so they survived that overdose, acknowledging that that is a risk factor for someone experiencing another overdose. 
a risk factor for someone experiencing an over, a fatal, a overdose. Sorry about that. And it's really important to highlight that our research um, really starts to show what this risk factor alludes to. And it alludes to, how, it's to the realities of how difficult it is for someone to make changes to their drug use. So acknowledging that before, between that initial and that next overdose that person may experience, they may not have the time or, the, or resources um, that are needed for them to make the changes that they're looking for in their drug use. Um, acknowledging that someone who overdosed, um, if they want to make changes, acknowledging that there are life situations that, that are not just in their control that can make that difficult. So thinking about if someone didn't have insurance, what if they were ready or, or interested in having conversations about potential treatment for their substance use disorder? Do they have someone to talk to? Do they have uh, any healthcare providers they can have that conversation with? Um, can, do they need other social services met? The reality is if someone doesn't have housing, they have inconsistent access to food, there are some basic life needs that um, that person needs support with, um, in addition to the support they may be seeking in regards to their drug use. So it's really important to highlight that if someone experienced a non-fatal overdose before, they are not at risk of ex uh, increased risk of experiencing another. Um, thinking as well, if they are ready or if they're interested in making change in their drug use, are they getting the services that align best for them in regards to their treatment? Does their treatment require uh, medication? And acknowledging that depending on the medication depends on where they may need to go to get their medication. And they may be fearful, they may be scared, acknowledging that sometimes the resources you need um, in making change to drug use aren't just tangible. They might be in regards to support. Do they have someone that might want to go with, who's willing to go with them to appointments and be that support for them? Um, so these are all things that um, can really impact someone in regards to their drug use um, and um, support that they may need if they're looking to make changes to their drug use. And that last one that's on this list is using alone. And it's a little misleading as before the fact that this is not a risk factor for an overdose. Using alone is a risk factor for someone experiencing a fatal overdose. Because if someone is by themselves when they use and they and then they overdose, that means there's just no one there to help them. There's no one there to respond to that overdose. There's no one there to administer naloxone. There's no one there to call 911. There's just simply no one there to help. And use of any opioids can put someone at risk of experiencing an overdose, but there are things that people can do to lower their risk of an overdose. So on the screen, I saw um, there was a little tech difficulties and exposed this part of the slide earlier, but it's really still great information for folks to be aware of. Um, so risk reduction strategies, harm reduction strategies, if or when possible, if someone has taken a break, can um, they consider um, you, or a break or Mr. Dose, use, consider using less or going slow, doing a slow shot, doing a test shot. Um, have they, uh, if possible, start to think about what an overdose response plan can look like? Do they have a phone on hand to call 911 if, if calling 911 is, necess uh, is deemed necessary? Um, if they um, could, if possible, or when possible, buy from people they trust and ask about changes in the product to get a sense of what that drug quality is at the moment. Talk to others about the drug quality. We do want folks, um, we do encourage folks not to use alone, um, but additionally, we, with using uh, with others, we still encourage them to take turns um, so that in case there is someone um, who needs medical attention, who is uh, someone who is overdosing, that there's still someone there to respond. And for many reasons, we acknowledge that people may still choose to use alone. So we want folks to know there's a never use alone hotline. Um, that number is on, this, on the screen at the moment. I'll read it out loud and also ask if one of my colleagues can put it into the chat. Um, it is uh, 800, so 800-484-3731. So this allows for an individual, even though they are physically using a loan in that space, this allows for them to be on the phone with someone. Um, and in case they become unresponsive, the person on the phone will send medical, medical help to that individual's location. 
So they are using a loan in that physical space, but they created a system so that um, help can still get to them if necessary. And if or when uh, uh, someone is ready to make changes to their opioid use, medication for opioid use disorder, um, such as methadone or buprenorphine, is a gold standard in treating someone with a opioid use disorder. It's really important for folks who are looking to make changes to their opioid use to really have conversations with their pro healthcare providers, consider medication, um, uh, methadone or buprenorphine as part of their treatment. Uh, so to continue on, when it comes to everything I just went over on that side, it was very specific to individuals who use drugs. But we do acknowledge that there's one thing that all of us can do to help in regards to dealing with that overdose crisis. Um, and this be, could be for anyone, someone who uses drugs, someone who does not. And really acknowledging how the words we use matter and how they have the potential to perpetuate stigma that we know has real life consequences for people who use drugs or potentially create an a, a opportunity to really engage people in a more compassionate way. So is that no one's fault on the left side of the screen, they may recognize these uh, potentially stigmatizing words, um, acknowledging that these words have become extremely normalized. Um, you may have used them yourself, you may have heard others use them, but acknowledging how these words convey judgment and they reinforce stigma. And how this has real life consequences for folks. And we know that a non judgmental and compassionate approach is likely to increase dialogue and create more opportunities for engagement, support, and understanding. Of course, we're not, say, uh, not saying um, that folks can't use the words that potentially stigmatizing to describe their own personal experience, uh, their own lived experience. We're just acknowledging that language and identity are very personal and want folks to consider how the words we use have the capacity to challenge the stigma, to lift people up and center their humanity. So on the right side of the screen, uh, of this table, you see more compassionate person-centered language that can be used instead of the language that we know has been, the stigmatizing language that we know has been uh, normalized. So that more compassionate person-centered language doesn't focus, focus on the fact that this person uses drugs. It focuses first on that they're a person. So I'm going to take a break before so for questions, if any have come in before going into um, starting to go into like those uh, how to recognize an over uh, an overdose the response steps and things of that nature. No questions, Shaquasia. OK, that works out because there's more question sections later on. So I can quick uh, go through that. And then when the next one comes in, um, let me know. Questions are being asked and answered in the um, Q&A. Are there any that you think would be worth lifting out to address? Sure, well, one? sure. one just posted asking, oh, several now. So there are several questions. Can a vape pen be laced with fentanyl? Why are they adding fentanyl to drugs knowing it's overdosing people? Those are two that just came in. So those are questions that we kind of ask ourselves um, in the Bureau and we aren't quite sure that like, there are many theories in regards to why a fentanyl we may be adding to product. We don't know, um, especially those that are not opioids because acknowledging that someone looking for um, the reactions of cocaine or crack, which are stimulants, is, the reaction is different than than opioids, um, so not so we really don't know for sure. Um, but again, there's a lot of theories. Like some folks say it's because it's cheaper, but also acknowledging that that may not be the only factor. Um, so it's just really hard to say. But what we do want folks to know that we um, fentanyl is present in our drug supply in different substances, and we want folks to be aware of that so that they can take some precautions to keep themselves safe. Um, the second question that you mentioned, Anisla, can a vape pen be laced with fentanyl? I have not heard of that. Um, has anyone else on the team heard of that? No, it has, that has not shown up in our data. 
Yeah. So sorry that we couldn't answer that such a specific question, but I do appreciate you sending it in. And then um, the other question that I think others may be curious about, someone asked how old are the people that are being over um, affected by overdoses. So those ages between 35 and 54 have the highest rates of overdose deaths, but we also have seen the rate of overdose deaths among 55 and 84 year olds has increased for, for now like six consecutive years. Yeah. Thanks, Anisla. Also, if possible, um, if folks have questions that are more specific about data, like Anisa, do you mind uh, posting a link to the most recent Epi data brief? Yeah. Um, uh, that does tend to give a little bit more details of what we cover in data um, in our training. And it, I believe it does have some of that information in regards to like age group. So uh, thank you so much for the questions. Continue to send them in. Um, now we're at the point of like understanding what naloxone is and just to briefly again to reiterate is a safe medication its only function is to reverse the effects of opioid overdoses essentially there is zero effect if there's no opioids present in someone's system and it does come in different formulations as i mentioned before so you see images on that on the right side of the screen it does come in a nasal spray um, as well as an intramuscular injection um, in regards to what I'll be uh, showing you how to administer today it will be uh, Narcan, the nasal spray formulation. Um, and want folks to know that there's no net known, no known negative effects. Sorry, that's a little tw a tongue twister there. Um, in regards to giving someone naloxone. But we do want folks to know that if you um, give someone naloxone who is opioid dependent or someone who's been using opioids for some time, it may put them into withdrawal. So it's really important when we get to the steps of, uh, once you recognize the signs and checking for responsiveness, uh, um, knowing that these steps, what you're doing is extremely important to kind of make sure that we all know that giving that person naloxone was necessary to potentially save their life. So we uh, will talk a little bit more about that later. There's no way for someone to misuse or become dependent on naloxone, as well as responders. So that's all of you who, uh, who are trained. Um, today, you do have New York State liability protection in regards to carrying and using your naloxone kits in good faith. So we saw this image uh, previously, and we see um, the opioids are uh, binding to those opioid receptors. We believe that this image is having an opioid overdose. We are giving this image Narcan, um, and now we see that there's, there's naloxone, these bluish kind of um, circle uh, images that now are binding or attaching to these opioid receptors. So I want you to know it takes about two to eight minutes for naloxone to start working. It takes naloxone about two to eight minutes to restore that person's breathing. And the naloxone will be in that person's system for 30 to 90 minutes. So for, it's really important that I point out, we made a point not to erase the purple circles, those opioid circles, um, for the fact that naloxone does not metabolize or eat up or get rid of the opioids in someone's system. The opioids will be in that person's body until their body processes it out at its normal rate. But what the naloxone does is just make sure that that person can breathe again and knocks the opioids off the receptors and allows for that person to breathe because the naloxone is now binding to those receptors. So that person, even uh, while that naloxone is in their system, they may not feel like their drug is in their system. However, we know that um, the opioids are still there and they just have to be processed out. So we'll talk, we'll see these numbers again. So I do want you to keep those numbers in mind, the two, uh, about two minutes and the 30 to 90 minutes. Uh, set of numbers because that gives you information in regards to the steps of responding. So when it comes to responding to an opioid overdose, acknowledging that this can put you closer than six feet to another person. So we do encourage folks to uh, try to avoid any unnecessary contact, but uh, as well as in wash hands um, before and after responding to someone's overdose. So these are the, what you see on the screen right now are the signs of we want you to look out for if someone is experiencing uh, an opioid overdose. Essentially, these are the signs of that respiratory depression. So 
it may be one or multiple of these signs that may be a sign of someone experiencing an opioid overdose. So just please be aware of, of any of their possibility. As we mentioned, it can uh, it, opioids lead to slow breathing, so it can be slowed or stopped breathing. Um, the person will be unconscious or unresponsive. Um, the person's lips or nails may turn blue, gray, or white. So please be aware of those different color variations as a sign of someone experiencing opioid overdose. That person may be giving off a deep snoring or gurgling sound as they're trying to get air, as well as we know that um, in fentanyl overdoses, sometimes they present with a muscle stiffness or rigidity where the person's limb may be, limbs may be stiff, their chest may be stiff, um, in that uh, rigidity, that muscle stiffness, their eyes may be open or closed. Even with their eyes open, they still won't be able to respond to you. So I want to make sure that folks know that they should be aware of uh, what is on the screen right now are the signs of someone put us experiencing an opioid overdose. And it's really important that we check for responsiveness of that person, because essentially this tells us if this person is in need of some medical help, if this person is in need of naloxone. So we want you to shout at the person. Um, really try to use your voice to get their attention, um, to try to uh, see if they are alert on any level. Like, hey, are you okay? I need you to wake up. If you don't wake up, I'm going to have to call 911 to get you some medical help. If you notice that that person is not responding to your shouting, then we want you to do the sternal rub. And the sternal rub is something we always want you to do before giving naloxone, because this is what, this is a way to check someone's responsive level. So we've already used our voice to try to wake them up. The person may not have respond, may didn't respond to the, the shouting you were doing. Then you want to do the sterner up. So I'm going to do that on screen on myself, but you'll be doing this to the other person. So what you would do is make a fist with your hand. The knuckles of your fist would find that person's breastbone or sternum, and you would grind your knuckles with pressures for about five to 10 seconds into that person's sternum or breastbone. By doing that, if you happen to be doing this on the other side of the screen with me, you may notice that it is very uncomfortable. That is important because that means you're doing it correctly because you're giving this person some kind of pain stimuli to try to get a response out of them. If they don't respond to that a sternal rub, that tells us that that person is not responsive, that they're unconscious, they're unresponsive. And we encourage you, um, to follow the next steps. In our naloxone kits, we do have non-latex gloves. Um, we do encourage folks to put them on, but we always wanna make sure we do that sternal rub before giving someone naloxone. If they are, uh, sometimes it is difficult for us to tell at times if someone is just under the influence of their substance or if they're actually overdosing. So if someone responds to the shouting or the sternal rub, even if that response is verbal, you want to try to keep them alert and monitor them closely. An overdose is still possible. Um, and so you want to keep that naloxone nearby and see if someone can stay with them or ensure that they won't be left alone. But when in doubt, we always encourage folks to call 911 for medical help. And when calling 911 for medical help, you want to give the dispatcher the exact address and spe specific location of the person in need of help and tell them the signs that you see that said this person needs some medical help. So that could be that person wasn't breathing, they're unconscious, they're not responding, they may be turning blue. But focus on the symptoms because the reality is those signs and symptoms are not exclusive to opioid overdoses. There could be another medical emergency. However, naloxone is still safe to give. The reality is, is that naloxone essentially has, uh, is like giving someone water. It has no effect that there's no opioids in their system. And the reasons why we want folks to call 911, because again, those signs are not exclusive to an overdose. It could be another medical emergency. And we want EMTs, we want EMS on their way to help with that situation. Other medical complications may have started depending on how long someone's been in an overdose and that person needs more support, as well as that they need more doses of naloxone. So the naloxone kits that we provide each come with two doses of Narcan. It is possible that someone may need more doses of naloxone and guess who has more naloxone with them when they are called? EMS. So there are many reasons why we encourage folks to call 911 to get medical help for someone who are showing the signs of an opioid overdose. And we still acknowledge how 
it can be really uh, re how some folks can be reluctant to call 911 and completely understand. So we want to highlight this specific legislation that was passed um, that really is there to encourage folks to call for help. So this law, off, so this is called the 911 Good Samaritan Law, and it does offer some protections in regards to, for the person who's experiencing the overdose and the person who is called, in regards to prosecution for, say, drugs up to A2 felony, so up to eight ounces of a narcotic, alcohol for those who are underage drinkers, cannabis of any amount, paraphernalia offenses, and sharing of drug charges. And at the same time, we also acknowledge how this is not a perfect law, even though it encourages folks to call for, for medical help for that individual. This law doesn't have any explicit protections um, and it, um, legal protections for probation or parole violations, violations of open warrants, issues related to immigration or child welfare that people may have going on in their life. So we want folks to be aware that we encourage folks to call 911. There is a 911 Good Samaritan law that exists and acknowledge the, the difficulties in real time and real life when it comes to responding to someone's overdose. And despite these protections in real life, responding to an overdose can be really scary. It can be complicated and overwhelming for people. Um, and acknowledging that this may uh, bring, bring, bring up feelings for a number of different reasons, but it's really important for individuals as well as for establishments to think about what an overdose response plan looks like for them, for their loved one, for their community members, for uh, their patrons, and what are some factors folks are dealing with um, when they're responding to an overdose as individuals. So acknowledging that folks may have responded to overdoses before and they may not feel like calling 911 is necessary. Um, they think they can handle the situation up by themselves. Acknowledging throughout this whole presentation, before I started with Ariel speaking, as, as well as through this presentation, acknowledging that how stigma Hello. Uh, I'm not sure if we're having technical difficulties. Perhaps somebody from the team can uh, pick up the presentation at this point, or should we wait for Shaquasia to unfreeze? <laughs> I, could, I could pick up. Just give Okay, fantastic. I'm sure she'll be back soon, but just in the interest of time. Yes. Thank you. It seems like it's an agency freeze because my Thing. My thing shut down too. Just a moment. Shaquasia. You're we can't muted. hear you. <laughs> ah, there we go. See, Ariel, yeah. you're not the only one. So yeah. I apologize for that. You um, froze that. at stigma. <laughs> at stigma. Okay. So let me get back to the slides. See? It happens, gotta appreciate everyone's uh, willingness to be patient with me um, and the technology here. Uh, so I am going to try to start sharing again. Um, can someone let me know just to make sure that you can see the slide again? It is seen. Okay, great, perfect. I'm not on mute. Uh, so just to continue on the last few things, acknowledging that there has been a long history of criminalizing drug use and the policies around drug use have been, uh, have been harmful and how that impacts on, a, um, on someone's willingness to uh, call 911, even though that they want to make sure that they're, they're the person that is in need of help gets help. So we know and want folks to know that there are NYPD overdose response squads that can uh, show up to, um, NYPD can show up to uh, the 911 calls if they, if they believe it's suspected uh, overdose, that these overdose response squads can investigate the scene and we follow people afterwards and that NYPD officers are mandated reporters of sus suspected child abuse, neglect and maltreatment. So knowing all of these things, it's no question why we understand why, why folks may be hesitant to call 911. 
And at the same time, we know that calling 911 is what we encourage folks to do as public safety and public health uh, professionals. We really, that is the practice that we want people to do. But we also understand the real realities that people navigate, um, how they navigate their, life, their lives and wanna make sure that they can stay safe. So it's really important to think about what an individual response plan can look like that acknowledges these difficulties of calling 911, but still allows for the person to respond. Later on in the training, there are, there's a section called things to consider. So acknowledging that as, uh, as uh, businesses and, and operators acknowledge and vendors, like acknowledging what do we wanna do uh, on site if someone is uh, overdosing, what is the plan in regards to responding? And we're gonna go over briefly some things that you wanna consider um, to kind of outline potentially what that response look, looks like before um, that emergency happens, um, if it happens at your location. So when it comes to administering Narcan, on the screen you see that it says uh, there are some numbers and in regards to giving Narcan, the first three are listed towards the top, peel, place, and press. We call those the three Ps. I'm in trainings, but acknowledging that um, if you haven't seen a Narcan device before, it comes in a blister pack. And to gain access to that blister pack, there's a peel tab in the top right corner of the blister packs for Narcans. We always want you to use that peel tab to gain access to the device. So once you've done the first P, um, uh, then you wanna place um, the Narcan device in the person's nostril. So right now I have a test device. This yellow sticker lets me know it's a test device. The yellow sticker is not on uh, Narcan devices in your kits. Um, so, what you wanna do is index the middle finger on top of the device and then a thumb on the side. So Narcan is a one-time use device. So once you press the plunger, all of the medication gets administered at that time. So we don't want you to put your thumbs on the plunger at that very moment. Um, we want you to make sure first you place it in a person's nostril. So the nasal part um, of the device should go into the person's nostrils to the tips of their nostrils or touching uh, your fingers on the top of the device. And then you wanna press the plunger with using your thumb. So what that, you may notice on the training device that the plunger has re-released. On the Narcan device, as you see that I'm holding next to it now, the plunger does not re-release. So you know um, that that Narcan device was used because the plunger now does not re-release itself. So you've administered the first dose. You peeled it out of the pack, you placed it in the person's nostril, and then you press the plunger. What we want you to do, which can be really difficult to do in an emergency, is that we want you to wait about two minutes. We want you to give that first dose of naloxone a chance to work. Once you give that first dose of naloxone a chance to work, if that person has not woken up, they have not become responsive, then we want you to go back in your naloxone kit and get the second dose of naloxone. So get the second dose and repeat the steps. Ideally, put the second dose in the opposite nostril than the first one. But acknowledging human nature in emergency situations, we don't always keep track of all those little details. And that's okay. And that's the, if someone needs that second dose, what's the most important thing is that you give that person the second dose. And we do encourage you to call 911 if 911 was not called before. And when someone um, does become alert after giving them naloxone, it's important for folks to know that this person may be feeling a lot of different emotions, um, acknowledging that they also may not be feeling well. But what we know um, folks say they have experienced when um, is that they're confused and afraid. They may not know what's going on. So if you are someone who's had to has to respond to an overdose you, uh, and you're a responder, we want you to try to stay as calmly as possible in that moment um, and try to explain to that person what happened, what was going on. You, have, you want to tell them that they were overdosing, that you gave them naloxone and ask them if they're feeling okay, because the reality is that person may be starting to go through withdrawal um, and they may not be feeling uh, comfortable withdrawal feels horrible. And we want to make sure that you also inform them the fact that the naloxone is in their system, that it does wear off in about 30 to 90 minutes. And in, in previous times, that person may be feeling withdrawal before and they may, um, may realize that taking more drugs before I help the withdrawal symptoms. And we wanna encourage them to not use drugs in that 30 to 90 minute window because it, using more drugs in that time frame is not likely to reduce the withdrawal that they're experiencing, but it may increase their risk of another overdose. 
So we do um, encourage you to discuss with that person to see if they want to get follow-up medical care, acknowledging if that person declines medical attention, see if someone can stay with them for at least three hours. So if you or your staff are CPR trained, anytime someone isn't breathing, we encourage folks to do CPR. Um, however, not everyone is CPR trained and someone may be experiencing an opioid overdose in front of them and they have one of our naloxone rescue, our overdose, our rescue kits. Inside those kits, they, in addition to the two doses of naloxone, the two doses of Narcan, there is a white packet. When Tour Open does allow um, access to a face shield, that allows someone to uh, provide rescue breaths. So if someone is not CPR trained, we encourage them to do rescue breaths anytime some, uh, with, in someone's overdose. So when it's opened up, I'm gonna open this up. I'm gonna put, put something behind it so you can actually see a little bit better. You see an outline of a face and there's language at the bottom of the face shield that says face-to-face -face face, uh, CPR face shield or mouth-to-mouth -mouth face shield. Um, we wanna make sure that's the language responders can read left to right because that would be the side you blow into when giving someone rescue breath. So what you would do is you wanna make sure that person is on their back, their chin is tilted up and their mouth is open. And you will match the outline that you see on the face shield with that person's face. That white filter piece that you see, my hand is behind right now is around the mouth region. You wanna make sure that is over the person's open mouth. And then what you would do is pinch that person's nose curls, acknowledging that this uh, so the face shield is going to be between you and the and the person. Pinch their nose closed, and then you're gonna uh, create a seal um, with your mouth over the face shield um, in that mouth filter piece region, and provide two normal size breaths, and then one breath every five seconds. So by doing CPR, if you are CPR trained or doing rescue breathing, you are essentially providing breath to the person who at the moment is experiencing that over. Uh, experiencing that overdose and can't uh, breathe on their own. But additionally, there's something else that you can do to help support someone in an overdose in addition to CPR or rescue breathing. And that is putting that person in the recovery position. And this is a supported position. This is a safe position to put someone in. And essentially you're gonna have that person on their side. As you see in the bottom image, um, bottom right image, the person is on their side on that flat surface just roll them over onto their side. The side that is on the flat surface, their hand or the arm is bracing their head and their chin is tilted up. And the, um, the side that is not on the flat surface, the arm and leg goes out in front of them in right angles. So what that, um, what that does is make sure that um, it's a safe position for the fact that this prevents them from choking and it keeps them from turning over on their back or stomach if someone is not with them. So acknowledging that there are three main times you want to have this person in the recovery position. So if the person, if you are not giving that person Narcan, you're not giving them naloxone in that very moment, you are not doing CPR or rescue breathing in that very moment, or you need to leave that person for whatever amount of time, you want to put them in the recovery position because that is the safest position for them to be in that supported position on their side. So acknowledging that putting someone in recovery position, rescue breathing may increase someone's risk of COVID-19. However, when they are done correctly, they both can help save a life. So we do just encourage you to wash your hands and face for at least 20 seconds after responding and doing those things. So these are the section I just mentioned earlier, things that we want you to consider, um, which is really important. So mentioning, um, thinking about what if there is an overdose on location, what do we want our staff to do? So these are some things that we want you to consider when thinking of what an overdose response plan can look like at your establishment. So monitor, assess, and communicate. So thinking about areas where um, individuals may uh, be current, may experience an overdose. For some locations, this may be restrooms. So someone may need to monitor their restroom, assess how long someone may have been in there, and communicate with the person in there to see if they're okay or not or communicate with other staff members who are responsible for checking to see um, on, on, uh, on patrons um, or on, on our clients. Then also thinking about calling 911 and creating a response area, um, knowing where naloxone kits are so that we can administer them um, in need of somebody to showing the signs of an opioid overdose, engaging with the people 
who are experiencing that emergency. So if that individual came with other folks, you may need to engage with them. So acknowledging what, what would you want your staff to do? Um, and acknowledging what would you want your staff to do if 911 is called in regards to uh, respond, uh, engaging with EMS, um, as, in, as well as NYPD. So thinking of how you want staff to engage with first responders, as well as follow up and report. Do we need to notify anyone in our business of this, uh, this incident with someone overdose? And additionally, let us know at the Department of Health because we want to make sure that you then have replacement naloxone kits. So these are just some things that we want folks to consider about what an overdose response plan could look like on site if um, an overdose happens and how we want our, our response to be uh, as, a, as an organization. So additionally, what is also important to think about is shared access naloxone kits or what we may call communal kits. So these are kits that can be used by trained responders to respond to an overdose on site. So thinking in the next section in about two minutes, we'll talk about how do you request a naloxone kit for your location and acknowledging everyone may not feel that everyone needs an individual naloxone kit. You can still have shared access or communal kits on site. So in case that emergency happens, there are kits there for someone to respond. So these can be conveniently located and just want to make sure they're accessible to staff. So thinking about they may be near the first aid kit that you have on site. So folks know exactly where they're at. And again, that New York State liability protection does apply to communal or shared access kits. So in regards to fentanyl test strips, we know that there was a question earlier as well as interest of knowing more about them. So again, just to reiterate, the naloxone kits do not come with fentanyl test strips in them, but just want to give some people uh, brief information about them. So fentanyl test strips can tell if drugs contain fentanyl, but they don't tell how much, tell you how much fentanyl is in the product or how strong it is in the product. So it's really important to uh, highlight that fentanyl test, test strips can prevent overdoses if they're used correctly with other risk reduction practices. And we talked about what some of those things were or could be for someone in, earlier in the training. Um, there are different ways to test for drugs, um, for test drugs for fentanyl using the test strips. So there is a fentanyl test strip instructional brochure. Um, the link is on the screen, but I'm also going to ask Anisla to put that in the chat so that folks have access to that. And it does uh, give instructions on how to uh, prepare a drug product to test um, for fentanyl using the fentanyl test strips. And additionally, um, are places where you can purchase fentanyl test strips at are also on the slide, but um, acknowledging that Nisla put them into the chat earlier when the fentanyl test strip question came up. I'm going to also ask for her to put it in the chat again, just so that folks have access to it um, once more. So in regards to how do you access naloxone as part of today's training? So the link that is on the slide right now, so sorry, Anisla, I have you putting things in the chat back to back. Um, Anisla is going to put into the chat how to request a naloxone kit um, to be mailed to you. So that link is going into the chat. I do want you to be aware that it can take up to 10 business days for your requested kit to arrive in the mail. Um, so if you feel that you need access to naloxone sooner, please check out our website at nyc.gov slash naloxone to find naloxone within your community. So we have a list of, the, of those locations on our website. And when you get a overdose response kit, um, what comes in that kit are two doses of Narcan nasal spray, the face shield, the two non-latex gloves, the education material that when it's opened on the, on the slide, but inside the kit, it looks like this. Um, the additional medication um, uh, instruction sheet that comes with it, as well as a blue certificate of completion is the size of a blue card. So it would also um, be in that mail kit with uh, uh, if you request an Aloxone kit, uh, request our res uh, re rescue kit. So if you are requesting a kit for your, your place of business, your location, those are shared access or communal kits where uh, trained responders can use. On that blue card, there is a space um, where you would want you to put the date, but additionally, there's a, sp a longer space where you would put a name. For communal or shared access kits, we want you to put the name of the business 
the uh, dash communal kit. So, and then additionally put that blue kit back into the, the, the blue bag for the, the naloxone kit. So once you complete the certificate of completion, that blue business card that I'm holding up right now, which comes with the mail kit, we want you to put it back into the kit. Um, we want you to make sure that anyone um, who, uh, who could potentially use an naloxone kit reviews the education material inside the kit so that they know the steps of responding to an overdose as well. So this goes over everything we went over today in regards to uh, what naloxone is, recognizing the signs of an overdose, checking for responsiveness, and following the response steps of how to administer naloxone. So if you ever use your naloxone kit, we do encourage you to reach out to us to submit an anonymous report. And this report just really helps us uh, get a sense of the response that was given, but it also helps us support the, the need for naloxone to be available to the public. And on the back of those blue cards is our contact information. So just reach out to us and most importantly, reach out to us so you can get a replacement on the kit that the kits that were used um, or need a refill for your kit. So acknowledging that if you use one of the two doses in your naloxone kit, we want you to reach out to us. A full naloxone kit is two doses of naloxone. If your kit is lost, stolen or damaged, reach out to us. If the naloxone inside the kit has expired or is near expired, we want you to reach out to us. An expiration of Narcan um, is on the, expiration dates of Narcan is on the back of the blister pack, the, uh, the bottom right um, of the blister pack. So just be aware of those expiration dates. However, we are all human and sometimes expiration dates skip our minds and we don't keep, keep the best track of them. And we don't notice that the, the medication has expired until we need to use it. If someone is overdosing in front of you and all you have is expired naloxone, we encourage you to, you to use the expired naloxone and call 911. Expired naloxone is better than no naloxone when someone is overdosing. But please do try to uh, keep, uh, be aware of those expiration dates. So in summary, we do want to highlight again that naloxone is a safe medication that reverses the effects of opioid overdoses. Um, we want you to look for those five common signs um, and maybe one or maybe multiple of those signs of what an overdose can look, uh, look like. Additionally, we want you to check for responsiveness by shouting at the person first and doing the sterner rub. And then additionally, administer or give that person a naloxone and provide additional support, which can be getting medical help, rescue breathing, or CPR for those who are CPR trained, and putting that person in recovery position and reaching out to us to report and refill your naloxone kits. So if you are interested um, of to have others attend this training or just wanna know how often these trainings around naloxone are being done by the Department of Health. Um, we do have our upcoming trainings on our website, on our webpage at nyc.gov slash naloxone. Right now um, on the slide, you see our next four upcoming dates in regards to naloxone training. So each month we provide three trainings a month um, to anyone for anyone to attend. These uh, trainings are all virtual at the moment. Um, there's a, a one, morning, afternoon, and evening. So encourage folks to sign up for an naloxone training if those times work for them. And if you would like to host an naloxone training, please email us at naloxone at health.nyc.gov. Um, and we can work with you to see how to best provide a training um, for, uh, for you and your staff. So this is the final question section. So I will take any last questions. Um, as in the last, as we have about five more minutes. Keisha Quasia, thank yes. you. Yes, we no have problem. several. We have several questions. Some of them have been um, answered in the chat. Um, so I'm just going to go through. Someone asked, "Can you pick up a kit somewhere in person because they don't want it? They can't have it mailed." Yes, there are places you can pick one up in person. Um, there, the there are links for programs that give naloxone kids to people in person and to ya yeah, um, put the link in the chat you could also go to our website naloxone at health.nyc.gov and there are for certain pharmacies that give out naloxone for free if you have any challenges please just always email us if you can't get naloxone either at these programs or at these pharmacies and we will find a way to get you naloxone so if you don't get your naloxone kit in the mail, please email us. Um, someone asked, 
what are the laws rules surrounding a person's right or ability to carry naloxone and Shaquija covered this um, talking about the Good Samaritan laws. So Shaquija, if you can repeat a little bit about the Good Samaritan law, because we also have another question about if an overdose happens in my workplace, a, a club, however, drugs are zero tolerance policy. Can 911 then come in and search the premises or blame the club or place of where the person overdosed? Yes. So thanks for those questions. So I'll try to answer the first one in regards to like the liability protection. So the way the public health law is set up that makes naloxone so easily available to folks, um, it does provide um, uh, protections uh, for those who are trained responders. So you all, um, in regards to carrying and using your kids in good faith, and uh, this is a New York state law, um, but also acknowledging that 911 Good Samaritan law that I spoke about um, earlier in the training is in regards to someone uh, calling to get uh, medical help for that, for the individual experiencing the overdose, if there are some other things that may be, ha uh, may be on scene um, or may be happening. And that provides some protections in regards to prosecution, but also acknowledging there also still is a good Samaritan law that people, uh, that, is on, that is on the books in regards to people providing first response um, in, in someone's medical emergency. And all of these things play out when someone is responding to someone's overdose. Um, to get more specific to the question in regards to can um, folks, can like if that one is called, can uh, officers like come on, on, on scene and like investigate? Is that, is that what you were saying, Anisla? Yes, the, they didn't say officers, they just, the question just says, can someone come and search the premises or yes. blame the club or place of where the person overdosed? So acknowledging that one that just really wouldn't be fair um, um, to blame the, the establishment where the person overdosed, but acknowledging that can someone come look, look into it? I can't speak to people specific actions that they take in those moments um, and how that really does complicate things for people when thinking of, of responding to overdoses as well as what's what might be happening on their premises. Um, and it's just really important for folks to still respond. Um, those liability protections, even for communal kids and those response still, uh, still apply. Um, to train to responders, so we do want folks to respond. But and I also apologize, I am not a I am not a lawyer. That is not my expertise. I went to school for some things, but being being the law was not one of them. Um, so I don't want to give you any incorrect information in that regards. I would just say, you know, we do, the Office of Nightlife does um, attend many Nightlife NYPD quarterly meetings um, and also uh, have conversations with top brass at uh, police. I am also not speaking as a lawyer or for the police department, but they, um, as I had mentioned in the beginning, are, are supportive, are aware of the life-saving measures of Narcan, um, as well as fentanyl test strips. Having um, illegal substances in a venue, they are still illegal. However, much like if there is a fight or other type of incident in a venue, it's not always a question of what happened there, but how you handled it when it did happen. And so I think this is part of why we also wanted to make sure that we took this incredible training that um, you and your division at the Department of Health provides to share with the nightlife community is to make sure that they are best prepared for what might be a situation that happens in their venue that might not be within their control, but what is in your control is how you respond and being able to be that venue that saves a life as opposed to not being prepared for that situation, I think plays deeply into the way that the police department would respond um, to that situation. Thanks, Ariel. And the only thing that I will add is that if you do have negative encounters with the police, it's important for you to let us know because the only way we can make changes is if we are documented these scenarios where anyone is facing any challenges. So please let us know. 
Um, I'm going to talk about, I have questions about administering naloxone, and then I have legal questions. So we have one more legal question, a question about whether the laws, the Good Samaritan laws vary state to state, or if there is a federal protection. There is no federal protection. Um, the laws vary state by state. And there is a link where you can look up the different um, Good Samaritan laws by state. I will look for those and I'll put them in the chat. So, and then the other question was about allergies. Are there known allergens for naloxone Narcan? So no allergies with naloxone are extremely rare, but I also wanna acknowledge that like all medication, there are some side effects. Um, what we ask folks is, what we let folks know is that the risk of death for someone overdosing on opioids is worse than the risk of having a bad reaction to naloxone. Um, let's and see. just to add, Anisla, this is additional an additional reason why we encourage folks to call 911 if they do need to administer naloxone to get medical help there for that, that person. Yes. And the other question is someone asked about rescue breathing. So when do you administer the rescue breath? The recommendation is that every time someone is not breathing, you provide rescue breathing. I acknowledge that not everyone feels comfortable with that or wants to do that. So it's really a personal choice again. So they ask whether it's after one dose of naloxone and during the two minutes or after two doses and during the second minute of the second dose. So again, anytime someone is not breathing, we recommend doing rescue breaths, but that is a personal choice. Also, if you're in a in a club, I know some agencies have the um, I don't know if you have them at your location with your first aid kit, the ambu care, the ambu bags, so that you can provide instead of doing like the rescue breathing mouth to mouth, you are able to provide some um, oxygen using these ambu bags for them. That that's another option if you wanted to add this to your safety kit within your establishment. That is also another option. Is there anything else you want to add to the rescue breast equation? You're on, on mute. mute. There we go. Um, so just to add additionally that we definitely went through these uh, steps as if this thing's like step one, step two, step three, and acknowledging in that emergency, it, it may not feel like that. You may, you may be the only person responding. You may have a team to respond and someone could be going to get the naloxone kit because they know where it's located while someone may have decided to start doing CPR or rescue breathing. Um, so it's, it's really acknowledging that every response to an overdose may not look exactly the same, but you do have the steps to, you know the steps that you can take to help save that person's life. So I think um, it's worth acknowledging that I think we've run over a little bit, a couple Can I minutes. just answer one question? I'm sorry, it was about oh, yes, the marijuana. Of course. We did have plenty answer, of people in the did room. Did I answer the question about marijuana? Did I answer the please, question? Please, please go right ahead. Okay, so I, I, I can't remember if I answered this, I'm sorry. So someone asked that there, someone said that in the news lately, they're, they're seeing about marijuana being laced with fentanyl and whether New York City has seen this, I wanna reiterate that we don't have data regarding the presence of fentanyl in cannabis. Um, we can only confirm that fentanyl is in heroin, cocaine, methamphetamine, and ketamine. I have heard instances of it showing up in Connecticut, but that has been like, news came out later on and said it was a mistake. And actually it is not, it's not fentanyl. Unfortunately, that news, does not get highlighted. So we don't, we always hear the first part of the story that we found like fentanyl and marijuana, but then we don't hear what happens afterwards where they realize actually it wasn't fentanyl or the tests they provided wasn't accurate. So right now we do not see marijuana. I mean, fentanyl in our marijuana. Just wanted to put that out there. Thanks, Nisa. Good to know. <laughs> All of this has been incredibly good to know. And honestly, I know Zoom is very efficient, but I just wish we were all in person so we could really applaud that incredible presentation that you just shared with, um, with us in the nightlife community. So first of all, just thank you um, for this. And I just wanna thank, you know, Shaquasia and Anisla and Antuya um, and all of the nightlife 
uh, operators and workers. I know that you announced that you give several uh, webinars three times a day, but our intention is to host another one that is nightlife specific right after the new year as well. Um, this as well as the fentanyl webinar that we hosted recently will both be available um, and can be distributed. Um, if anyone has any questions and don't know how to reach uh, this great team at the Department of Health, you can reach out to the Office of Nightlife and we will also continue to answer your questions. Uh, we know there's a lot more concerns, a lot more questions, but this is a really good start on changing the conversation and how we approach the use of um, substances and how nightlife spaces can really be used, not just as a place to socialize and not to just be seen as a liability, but really to be seen as an asset, as an opportunity to save lives and take care of each other. And that's really um, the beauty of nightlife in addition to so many other things it contributes to New York. There's a lot going on. Um, we will continue to do our work at the Office of Nightlife to support mental health of the nightlife community with our Elevate Nightlife Mental Health Initiative. Check it out on our um, Instagram and newsletter. We have free weekly mental health online support groups for everyone as well. And just continue to let us know what you need and we'll continue to do our best to provide that for you. And in the meantime, it is the holidays. And so we just encourage everyone to truly be um, safe and find your joy and to have a successful and better new year ahead. And we will be in touch with you soon. And thank you again to the Nightlife team and the Department of Health and um, to you, the courage of the Nightlife community. Stay strong and we will be in close touch soon. Thank you all so much.